Welcome to the September meeting of the nonprofit Plant-Based Plant Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin, uh, or PB Now. I'm your host, Terry Lynch. Uh, the mission of our nonprofit group is to educate, inspire, and support each other on an evidence-backed whole plant foods food-based nutritional path for health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everyone, uh, those plant-based and those just curious about it. It's meant to be a non-judgmental place for people to come get information, inspiration, and support. If you'd like more information about our group, uh, our upcoming meeting dates, speakers and resources, or to check out videos of our past meetings, just Google us at uh, PB now, or that's pbnow.org. As we do each time, can I see a show of hands, either by raising your hands or using the thumbs up icon on uh, Zoom, uh, to show how many of you are currently plant based, following a plant based lifestyle? That's just almost half at this point. That's great. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition in improving health, quality of life for people of all ages as published in non-biased medical research is quite striking. Whether it's improving health through increased energy, weight loss, preventing slowing, stopping, or reversing problems like allergies, digestive problems, diabetes, heart disease, and early dementia, or increasing our quality of life by helping us feel better quickly, strengthening our immune system, increasing our endurance, improving athletic performance, speeding recovery from exercise, reducing joint pain, clearing thinking, or reducing the physical, emotional, and financial side effects of the illnesses, drugs, and procedures often recommended to treat the conditions that plant-based nutrition can help us avoid. The research shows our bodies do a wonderful job of healing themselves if we stop damaging them daily with poor nutrition and start giving them the nutrition they need to heal and function optimally. It's truly remarkable. Now, let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. Uh, tonight, we'll hear from two speakers and we'll see a short video. First, we'll hear from our PBNL Medical Director, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Next, we'll see a 12 minute video by Rip Esselstyn, who some of you may know by uh, reputation, on what he eats in a day. And following the video, our featured speaker, Dr. Penny Chris Etherton from Penn State will begin and she'll follow her talk with uh, Q&A. Our program should end at 7.30 like it normally does. As a reminder, we have meetings every month, usually on the second Thursday of the month at six o'clock central time. Next month, we'll hear from Florida orthopedic specialist, former professional doubles tennis player and fourth generation vegan, Dr. Stefan Esser. We'll be posting more information about our upcoming meetings on our website, pbnow.org. Uh, we don't have next month's up there yet, but we'll get it up this week. If you register uh, early next by early next week anyway, if you register on our website, you'll receive email reminders of our events as they approach. Uh, quick technical notes. During the meeting, everyone but the speakers will be muted, and we ask that you stay muted to avoid background noise and to allow everyone to hear the speakers. Uh, and during Q&A, we'll use the chat box and the hands up icon where I can call on you to ask questions. All right, here we go. Our first speaker tonight is a fellowship trained cardiologist. He is past president and current trustee of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology. He is a member of the American College of Cardiology's National Nutrition and Lifestyle Work Group, whose membership includes nationally known physicians such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Neil Bernard, and thanks to Dr. Liberman, our featured speaker tonight. Uh, he's an advocate for the use of plant-based nutrition to help improve heart health, general health, and the quality and quality of life, and has seen the benefits of plant-based nutrition in both his personal life and that of his patients. We're fortunate to have him here in Milwaukee and as our PB Now Medical Director. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Joshua Liberman. Hi, everyone. 
Thanks, Terry, for that uh, kind introduction. As always, uh, you always list all those names of those, you know, super famous and very smart people, and I always feel completely inadequate uh, in that in that company. So I appreciate I appreciate you that you continue to do it at least because at, at least it'll make my mom feel good. <clears throat> um, so uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for, for for being with us uh, tonight again. Uh, we have uh, some great uh, speakers and some great content tonight. Um, as you know, I, I, I like to talk about some uh, recent research uh, that is, you know, hit the wire, so to speak, uh, when, I, when I come on, as well as, you know, patient experience. I'm going to have to skip the patient experience this time, uh, um, but I, I would like to talk about some, some research. Um, and uh, it's, it's a little bit off the topic of plant-based nutrition, but you all know that sometimes I do that. I, I, I throw a curveball here and there and talk about sodium or, or processed food or things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, for the most part, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching the choir when I talk about plant-based nutrition research. And again, you know, even when uh, uh, you, Andrew Friedman, you know, we, we invite him to give a talk once a year and he, he gives the, you know, the, a, you know, a rundown of the 50 most recent research studies that all talk about how plant-based nutrition is really good for your skin or your heart or your, your, your sex life or your, your lungs or your breathing or allergies or all these different kinds of things. Um, and there's all that research coming out, and I could easily just keep doing that and talk to you about the most recent piece of research that substantiates what you're going to do. But I'd like to, um, I, I want to push push you guys, push the audience a little bit, um, and and talk about something that I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but a recent paper paper really highlighted it to me was uh, was this concept of food deserts, right? So there are um, communities that 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 are near us right next to us, zip codes that, that we might be living in or living next to, um, where they do not have access to the, the same healthy food uh, that, that you and I may take for granted. Uh, hopefully we don't take it for granted, but you and I may take for granted. And um, there's been a lot of research over decades about the impact of what a food desert is, right? So when, when a food desert is where you don't have a, a supermarket or, or a place where you can not buy fresh groceries, fresh fruits and vegetables um, anywhere near you and the impact that can, that can have on your health. And, and there was a, an article that came, uh, that, I, that, uh, that I, I came across that, that really was, was, was striking to me. And that was, um, it was, it was published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease. So it was mostly focusing on, on, on uh, the incidence of chronic kidney disease, but it looked at Chicago, right? Our neighbor just to the South. And it was done by researchers at Northwestern University. And it was what we call a retrospective study. So it looked at the years 2007 to 2012. And they took almost 800,000 people, 777,000. Uh, so, you know, uh, I guess that's more of a, of a kind of a, uh, what is that? A jackpot uh, uh, kind of thing. But 777,000 people who, who did not have high blood pressure, diabetes, or kidney disease in the year 2006. So they identified people, and it's all based on medical records. They identified people who didn't have any of those three diagnoses, who lived in one of the 56 zip codes. 56, I did not know that. But uh, 56 um, uh, Chicagoland zip codes. Um, and they looked at, uh, out of all those people, what happened over the next five years. And they then looked at what happened to them in comparison with or in relationship to um, their average distance to a supermarket. And what they, what they defined as a supermarket was um, a place where you could get um, a diverse line of groceries with five or more checkout lanes, right? So this rules out the neighborhood you know, corner bodega that might have a couple limes and a couple lemons, uh, you know, but then a bunch of uh, you know, processed food and, 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 and Pringles and stuff like that, right? And so five or more checkout counters and a diverse line of groceries. And they, they mapped the average distance from the nearest supermarket like that to the zip code. And then they looked at whether there was a relationship uh, based on, on that distance to the incidence of hypertension, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. And sure enough, you, you, we wouldn't be here talking about it if, there, if, if it wasn't uh, clear that there was a strong relationship. Um, two pieces of information really, really uh, came out to me with this. One is that over the next five years, so again, remember, the number was 777,000 people, almost 778,000. Of that number of people, over 400, 404,000 here, where, where's the exact number? 404,000 people developed high blood pressure. 
So let me just let that sink in for a second. They're looking for just a relationship between distance of, you know, supermarket to where these people are living. But completely independent of that is the fact that over 50% of these people developed high blood pressure in the next five years. In this random group of 56, not random, in, in 56 Chicagoland zip codes, over 56, over 50% 50 of people developed high blood pressure. That's astounding. And I'm not even getting into, you know, relationship to where, you know, the nearest supermarket is or race or access to cars or any of these kinds of things, right? Health insurance, anything. The simple fact of the matter is that over 400,000 people, over 50% of people developed high blood pressure. That is crazy to me. It is absolutely crazy to me. And it shows how big of a problem chronic disease is in this country. Okay, but beyond that, um, sure enough, there was a significant relationship between <clears throat> the, the average distance from that zip code to the nearest supermarket and the incidence of chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and, uh, and, and hypertension. What does this mean? It just means that, that at some point, whatever, whatever job you have, whether you're retired or not, whether, you're, you, know, whether, whether you have access to, to people who make decisions or not, somehow we have to advocate for those in our communities that are less advantaged, that don't have the same advantages that we have, um, you know, being able to, you know, you know, to, to do everything that we do in, in our everyday lives. Um, we have to understand uh, that at a, a very um, deep level, our zip codes determine our health outcomes, which is a scary thing to think of. But for many people in this country, the zip code that they live in is actually more impactful than their genetic code. Their zip code is more impactful than their genetic code in their ultimate uh, health outcomes. And, and somehow, um, I, I know that everybody in this call you know, just wants to talk about, you know, plant-based eating and, and, and how to be healthy and, and everything maybe on an individual basis. How can I as an individual be healthier? Um, but somehow we have to uh, figure out solutions for our communities um, in, 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 in helping to develop sources of food um, and, and uh, ease of getting to that, you know, he hopefully healthy, nutritious, hopefully plant-based food. Um, it's nice to see when I go around to farmers markets on the weekends, um, it's nice to see that more and more of them are accepting um, WIC or SNAP, you know, the food stamp kind of programs, uh, and that there's a, a lot of, and a lot of the, 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 the farmers are doing that, which is, I think, wonderful. And, um, you know, a lot of these, the, there are more and more farmers markets uh, in community, in disadvantaged communities or, or, or zip codes that, uh, that typically have worsened health outcomes. Um, one of them is the Fondi food market uh, just west of, of I-43 uh, uh, near North Ave. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, uh, farmer's market. Um, and, you know, whatever we can do to support this stuff, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd highly recommend. So uh, with that, um, I think I've, I've preached enough to y'all um, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there. Uh, with that, Let's move on to our featured speaker today. Our featured speaker is an internationally known nutrition researcher who has published over 360 papers in peer-reviewed literature. Her research has been cited over 140,000 times. She is the Evan Pugh University Professor of Nutritional Sciences and Distinguished Professor of Nutrition at Pennsylvania State University where in addition to overseeing the cardiometabolic research lab, she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses. She is chair of the American Heart Association's Council on Lifestyle and Cardiometabolic Health and past chair of the American Heart Association's Nutrition Committee. She is past president of the National Lipid Association and is involved with, excuse me, numerous other professional organizations. She has received awards from the American Society for Nutrition, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and from many other professional organizations for her contributions to the profession. Following her talk tonight with us, she will be available to answer some, some of your questions. So please make note of any, anything that pops into your head or any questions that uh, 
you think of during the presentation, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible at the end. Now I'm pleased to welcome our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Penny Chris Etherton. Dr. Etherton? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lynch, for the invitation to be here today and talk to you about healthy plant-based diets and healthy nutrition and decreased risk of chronic disease. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Yeah, okay. And let's make sure everybody can see this now. Okay, that's not working. Hang on just a second here. I'll get this in a minute. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Great. Super. Okay. So we're going to talk about plant-based diets, healthy diets, and decreased risk of many chronic diseases. So this is the outline of my presentation today. I want to talk about the leading causes of mortality in the United States. And it's so interesting to me that these can really be prevented by not just a healthy diet, but healthy living. Let me talk a little bit about that. Talk about how an unhealthy diet, it really is a leading risk factor for cardiometabolic diseases. And those are the leading causes of mortality in the United States. We are sp spending billions of healthcare dollars on preventable diseases. And then I'm gonna go over dietary recommendations for health, and talk a little bit about how the US diet is just so terrible. It falls way short of meeting current recommendations. And um, then we'll look at some real interesting new findings, new science that shows that a healthy dietary pattern uh, can decrease major causes of mortality. And then I wanna talk about plant-based diets. And what I think is really important is focusing on healthy plant-based diets. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about nutrients that uh, especially vegans need to pay attention to and dietary sources of them. And we'll look at resources as well that you can access for healthy eating on a plant-based diet. Then I'll sum it up. Before I sum it up, I added just a couple of slides on the blue zones. I don't know if you've heard about them, but there are countries where um, you know, people enjoy increased longevity, and many people live to be 100 years old. So we're going to look at what they do to have this increased healthy life, long life. Okay, this shot shows the leading causes of mortality uh, in 2007 and 2017. And it is so amazing to me that we really haven't moved the needle much. Look at that, cardiovascular disease is number one, cancer, number two, neurological disorders um, like dementia, number three, uh, respiratory problems, number four, diabetes and chronic kidney disease, number five, digestive diseases, number six. It's incredible, you know, look at this. Um, all this time has passed and we really haven't made much progress at all with the leading causes of death in the United States. And so what are the major risk factors? Well, look at the top in 207, dietary risks. Same thing in 2017, dietary risk. But, you know, I, I also boxed a lot of risk factors that are affected by a poor diet. What are they? Well, high blood pressure, that's number two in 2017. And then you can take a look at the others high fasting glucose level, high body mass index, high LDL cholesterol. And all of those are major risk factors for cardiometabolic disease. All of these can be you know, favorably affected, decreased by healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. So we have our dietary guidelines. Here are the 2025 dietary guidelines for Americans. And, you know, basically there are four overarching recommendations. The first is to follow a healthy dietary pattern throughout life at all life stages. And, and you know, so often we say, well, maybe it doesn't matter so much for kids. Um, but 
you know, it does matter a lot for kids. And so we really want people to start right out of the gate with a healthy diet and continue from, you know, basically birth to death. And then the second one is that, you know, healthy dietary pattern really can be individualized and, you know, they can reflect personal personal preferences, uh, cultural traditions, and budgetary considerations. And number three, um, the main message is focus on nutrient-dense foods. And you can see the byline for these dietary guidelines, make every bite count. And, and I think that that's a very good message. You know, some people say, well, you know, you can have some fun foods. Well, why? You know, just focus again on the nutrient dense foods. And I really like that video that was just shown. Boy, what just healthy meals were prepared. Every single food that was used is a nutrient dense food. And there's a, then there's a recommendation to limit foods and beverages that are high in added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium and also limit alcoholic beverages. So these are those recommendations that I just talked to you about, but I wanna focus on number four now because we do have very specific recommendations for saturated fat, less than 10% of calories, less than 10% of calories from added sugars, uh, less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, and for alcoholic beverages, if people drink one drink a day for women, and two drinks a day for men are okay. That's considered moderate consumption. So on the basis of those overarching recommendations, three healthy eating patterns have been issued and defined. And so let's take a look at these. Um, you know, there are they're very similar, but I'm going to focus on the healthy vegetarian eating pattern. Um, and then we'll talk about a vegan eating pattern because it certainly can be made to be vegan and healthy vegan. But what we see here is that the current recommendations are translated to foods. This is what people can follow, food-based recommendations. It's hard to think about numbers. What does 2,300 milligrams of sodium mean? What does less than 10% of calories from saturated fat mean? But this is resoundingly clear. We should be eating about two and a half cups of vegetables per day. And you can see that there are specific recommendations for dark green, red and orange, beans, peas, and lentils. They fall in the vegetable category, and starchy veggies and others as well. So um, we really want to eat you know, a lot of vegetables and include a variety of them, but certainly make sure that we're eating uh, red and orange ones and also leafy green ones. In terms of fruits, you can see two to two and a half cups per day are recommended. So we're telling people to eat, you know, four and a half to five cups of fruits and vegetables a day. And I thought that on that video that you just saw, boy, that was great in terms of the blueberries and the mangoes and, you know, also the veggies that are the broccoli that was being included. Very easy to get, you know, five cups of fruits and vegetables a day. Grains, about six ounces a day, of which half should come from fiber-rich whole grains. Um, dairy products, uh, and this could be um, non-dairy alternatives like soy milk, and two to three cups a day is recommended. Protein foods, uh, anywhere from three and a half to six and a half ounces per day are recommended. So you could see here for People who do eat uh, animal foods, there are specific recommendations for seafood, uh, meats, poultry, and eggs. These would be the lean varieties, and that's 26 ounce equivalents per week. That really does mean about three and a half ounces a day. And in nuts, seeds, and soy proteins. So you can see the recommendation there um, is five ounces per day. But um, let's see, for people who are following, let's see, a vegetarian diet, move this over a little bit. Um, you know, the eggs can be substituted with uh, legumes, beans, peas, lentils. You can see specific recommendations for soy products and nuts and seeds too. So I, I really do like this a lot because, um, you know, it, it 
these food-based recommendations give a lot of versatility to us and following a healthy diet in a lot of different ways. And people go so far as to say that these truly are all plant-based diets. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, what the definition is. But um, with respect to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, plant-based means an emphasis on plant-based foods. Not exclusive, but just emphasis on it. Okay, so how do Americans do in meeting those recommendations? They do terribly. And so that you can see here that the purple bar is intake at or above recommendations, and the blue bar is intake below recommendation. And you see here that in terms of total vegetables, we're way below current recommendations. In terms of dark green, red and orange, beans and lentils, starchy vegetables, and other vegetables, we fall way short of meeting current recommendations. Fruits as well, in terms of total grains, well, we are eating you know, the recommended amount of servings of total grain, but we're way, way short in meeting whole grain recommendations. Basically eating all of our grains as refined grains. Dairy, we fall way short of current recommendations, two to three servings a day. Total protein foods, well, we are eating the amount of total protein foods, um, but you see, we fall way short of meeting seafood recommendations. And in terms of plant products, plant foods, way short of meeting recommendations for nuts, seeds, and soy protein. So we have a lot of work to do. And then when we look at specific you know, nutrient recommendations, we fall way short in meeting added sugar recommendations. We're consuming about 13% of our calories from added sugars. And so um, the orange part shows how many people are exceeding current recommendations. So anywhere from 59% to 63% of Americans eat way too much added sugar. Anywhere from 70 to 73% eat uh, way too much saturated fat. You can see that men in particular, 97% are just um, eating way too much sodium. So again, we have a lot of work to do in meeting current recommendations. So um, we like to look at diet quality, and it's just um, a measure of, you know, for meeting food-based recommendations. And so our diet is pretty bad. Out of a total possible score of 100, we get a score of about 59. And you can see that we've kind of, you know, done a little bit better over the years from 205 to 206. Our diet quality score is 56. And now we've bumped it up to 59. So we've made some changes. And you can see that certain groups, uh, in particular, uh, real young kids and then older adults have a little higher diet quality than the average American. But for the most part, our diet quality is, you know, not good at all. We have a lot of work to do in improving diet quality. So um, here are some more recommendations from American Heart Association that came out in 2021. And there aren't specific recommendations for saturated fat, cholesterol, added sugar, and salt, basically because these food-based recommendations are inherently low in these nutrients. So what are the recommendations? Well, try to achieve a healthy body weight. Eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. Choose uh, mostly foods with whole grains. Choose healthy sources of protein. What are they? Mostly protein from plant foods. Fish and seafood, okay. Low fat or fat-free dairy products or dairy alternatives, perfectly okay. And if meat or poultry are desired, um, you know, choose the leanest forms and eat uh, limited amounts. Use plant oils, liquid oils. I'm mean, talking a little bit about fat in the diet in just a little bit but we should be avoiding tropical oil and animal fats. Tropical oils are uh, coconut, palm and palm kernel oils, and animal fats, butter and lard. We should also avoid partially hydrogenated foods as well. And here's something you know, new and is top of mind for everybody. Choose minimally processed foods and avoid ultra processed foods. The Americans eat so many ultra processed foods. And this is something that 
um, you know, is really loaded with sodium, added sugars, and refined grains. Uh, minimize intake of fruits and, and minimize beverages and foods that have added sugar. Pre choose and prepare foods with a little salt. If you do drink alcohol, if you don't drink alcohol, don't start. But if you do, limit intake. And no matter where you are, so many people eat out. They're not cooking at home anymore. So I love that video. You know, just quick, healthy cooking is the way to go to meet these current recommendations. Okay, so here's an infographic that translates those messages into a picture. And you can see here that these are the foods that we want to emphasize. And fruits and vegetables, whole grains, healthy proteins, and liquid plant oil. And here are the foods that we want to minimize, or in my opinion, eliminate. And you can see um, here are beverages uh, with um, you know, added sugars, uh, ultra processed foods. You see those here, these uh, salted pretzels, um, and you know, alcoholic beverages here, and foods high in sodium as well, and tropical oils. I think this is a good picture to very simply translate the AHA dietary guidelines. Okay, let's talk about healthy plant-based diets. And um, now this definition varies widely. What is a plant-based diet? Well, we can all agree that plant-based diets focus on foods primarily from plants. And they emphasize whole, nutrient-dense, minimally processed foods. Now, some definitions include exclude all animal products and some, um, you know, say minimal animal products are okay. And then they can vary in fats and oils. Some are very low in fat and some are more liberal in fat. So I think then a popular accepted definition is that Plant-based diet includes all animal products, which is a vegan diet, whereas others note that a plant-based dietary pattern can have some um, fish, poultry, eggs, and dairy products. Okay, so now let's look at some of the data here that shows the health benefits of a healthy plant-based diet and an unhealthy plant-based diet. Let me just do this here. See if I can move this a little bit. Um, anyway, this is data from Harvard investigators, and they look at uh, many individuals. It's over 50,000 people from the Nurses Health Study 1, Nurses Health Study 2, and Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. So there are lots of people represented in the studies I'm going to show you. And basically, okay, let me just see this here. The yellow bar or the yellow line shows a plant-based diet. I kind of need to move this here a little bit. Let's see how I can move this. Okay, here we go. Um, the blue line shows a healthy plant-based diet and the red line shows an unhealthy plant-based diet. And uh, basically uh, in terms of decile of the plant-based diet indices, uh, what's risk for heart disease, what's risk for type two diabetes. And I think that the important thing here is that an unhealthy plant-based diet, what are we talking about? French fries, cola beverages, lots of added sugars, lots of ultra processed foods. There are all sorts of bars out there that people think are healthy and they're not. That, that with increased consumption of an unhealthy plant-based diet, um, risk of heart disease increases risk of type 2 diabetes increases as well. What we want people to do is eat a plant-based diet. That's going to decrease risk of heart disease, diabetes, but healthy plant-based diet with all the foods that I just talked about, fruits and vegetables, uh, fiber-rich whole grains, dairy alternatives, lean protein foods, plant-based protein, and liquid vegetable oil will decrease risk of both cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Okay, so um, also with cancer as well, 
in people who are prone to breast cancer. I'm sorry, people who are not prone to breast cancer and people who are at risk for breast cancer. And what we see is that a healthy plant-based diet um, as you know, the healthy plant-based diet index increases, risk of breast cancer decreases. But if somebody's eating an unhealthy plant-based diet, you can see that their risk of breast cancer increases. And likewise, people who are um, at genetic risk for breast cancer, um, a, a real good healthy plant-based diet can decrease risk of breast cancer. And that has to be, you know, in like the top, uh, fourth decile, you know, so it's a real healthy plant-based diet that is going to decrease risk here. Whereas with an unhealthy one, you can see that that tends to, you know, not change risk, maybe even increase it compared to, um, you know, certainly compared to a healthy plant-based diet. Okay. So in terms of body weight. I think this is really interesting. So they looked at, this is nurses health and health professional study, and they looked at intake of healthy plant foods, less healthy plant foods and animal foods and weight changes over a four-year period. And let me just uh, focus here on the healthy plant food line. That's the solid line here. And so let's just look at if they didn't change their diet at all, this point here, but if they added one serving a day of a healthy plant food, they actually had a decrease in four-year weight change. And look what happened when they added two servings of healthy plant foods. You know, in our society, we have age-related weight gain. And the next study I'm gonna show you by the same investigators found that over a four-year period, we tend to gain about 3.55 pounds. You know, Americans tend to gain about a pound a year, but following a healthy diet can actually decrease that compared to somebody eating animal foods, somebody eating less healthy plant foods. Look at this one here, less healthy plant foods. We're talking about those cola beverages. We're talking about um, potato chips and French fries. They're gaining weight. And with the animal diet, they gain weight. So going on a plant-based diet and uh, just, you know, including adding one additional serving a day can actually stop that age-related weight gain that we're all experiencing. So this is another study that kind of looked at the same thing. It was published earlier, but basically, let me focus on the right-hand side of the slide. And what are those foods that are causing weight gain? Well, here they are. They're unhealthy, and a lot of them are plant-based foods, potato chips, uh, French fries, causing weight gain in these three different cohorts, processed meats, unprocessed red meats, butter, sweets and desserts, and refined grains. In contrast, the foods that are not causing any ch weight change, cheese, but those that are causing you know, a decrease weight gain are vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and yogurts. Look here, what other beverages are causing weight gain? Sugar-sweetened beverages, they're terrible, and 100% fruit juice. And then, you know, in one cohort, yeah, milk, even low-fat or skim milk can cause an increase in weight. Whole milk doesn't, and zero-calorie zero soda can cause a, a decrease or is associated with a decrease. So I think that this is really very, very telling. And it, it does speak to the importance of a good quality, high quality plant-based diet. Okay, so um, this is a study that just came out uh, in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it looked at uh, a cognitive score in whites and African-Americans. And it's sort of interesting, you know, as people age, well, yeah, they do lose some cognitive function. Uh, but interestingly, uh, what these investigators found is that um, basically with African-Americans, uh, those that had the worst diets had the biggest decrease in cognitive function 
uh, over a 10 year period. And those that had, you know, a high quality diet didn't lose as much cognitive function. And this is just in the African Americans. They didn't see this in the white cohort. But I think that this is really an interesting study that just came out. It's going to be followed up on. And it basically shows, at least in African American, it really does, you know, speak to the importance of following a high quality diet and avoiding loss of cognitive function over a period over a period of 10 years. And this is total mortality. And so this is kind of interesting um, with, uh, so just look at healthy plant-based diets. And so that what you see here is if, if um, a diet, if, if somebody changes their diet to be more healthy, then they can live long is what it boils down to. They have less decreased mortality here. In contrast, with these unhealthy plant-based diets we've been talking about, look at their death rate increases. So we're seeing just across the board, the health benefits of a healthy plant-based or high quality diet on all of those chronic diseases that you know are taking their toll on our healthcare system. So this is a slide that comes from uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about nutrients that people who avoid all animal products should be paying attention to and the food sources of them. So what are they? Well, calcium. So we know that calcium intake in many vegans in particular tends to be low. We know that um, dairy products are a major source of calcium, uh, but um, a lot of vegans uh, don't uh, don't drink or don't use uh, animal-based dairy products so that uh, they really need to be sure to use fortified plant-based milks. And I really make a point of this because there are a lot of plant-based milks out there that are not fortified. Uh, certainly the soy-based products are fortified with calcium. So I think um, if you're uh, a total vegan, just make sure that you're, um, you're getting uh, calcium-fortified plant-based milk alternatives. And you can see other sources here, uh, calcium-set tofu. And there are some leafy green vegetables that are good sources of calcium as well. Um, what is recommended is to get a variety of foods in the diet that provide calcium because um, sometimes um, calcium absorption from um, vegetables is not as good as uh, like plant-based dairy alternatives. In terms of iron, um, what, what's recommended is consuming sources of vitamin C um, with uh, foods that that with plant-based foods that are sources of iron. So, for example, dark leafy greens, uh, the spinach that you saw um, in the video. Boy, uh, it's great that uh, spinach has is is also served with a citrus food like uh, sprinkle some lime over it. That really does help with absorption. But you can see some other sources as well, like fortified breakfast cereals is you know another source of iron so soybeans as well uh, protein it's found in plant foods as well as animal foods and so what's recommended is just to get a variety especially a variety of plant plant-based protein foods including legumes such as beans lentils peas soy is also considered a legume but there are other plant sources as well whole grains and nuts and nut butters are also an excellent source. And there are two more nutrients to pay attention to. So one is vitamin B12. And we know vitamin B12 is found in foods of animal origin. So like eggs and dairy products. So vitamin B12 is one of those that really can be a concern for many vegetarians, especially vegans. And so if you're following a vegetarian style of eating, then you really need to choose foods fortified with vitamin B12, and just make sure that your vitamin B12 status is normal. Talk to your healthcare provider. Um, just make sure that you're 
your status is good. So here are some vegetarian sources, vitamin B12 fortified foods and uh, fortified nutritional yeast, soy milk, meat substitutes, ready to eat cereals, um, and then other sources as well. And finally, vitamin D, that's another one that uh, many vegans have a hard time getting enough of. Uh, certainly it's in fortified dairy products. Um, if you're in the sun a lot, you don't have to worry so much about vitamin D, but some vegetarian sources of vitamin D include vitamin D fortified milks. So I really think if you are drinking or using, um, you know, alternative dairy products, make sure that they're fortified with calcium and vitamin D. Mushrooms exposed to UV light also is a source. Okay, so what are some resources for you? I think that my plate uh, is a really fabulous resource. So I urge you to check it out. Um, they have a lot of really good materials on vegetarian meals. And um, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> they uh, they provide uh, you know lots of eating tips. You can see here. Start with these tips. Make some simple changes. Think about plant based protein. Build strong bones with calcium. Um, you know, have beans for dinner or lunch. But they have a lot of really good recipes as well. And then I think that this is a real good uh, resource too. The vegetarian resource group. Uh, so you can check this out. Um, you know, you can see some nutrition tips here. Uh, I really like to encourage people to use fiber-rich whole grains. That includes brown rice. It also includes whole grain breads and cereals. And then eat a variety of foods in all the different food groups. Uh, see, And you can look at the, the nutrients that they cull out here, like vitamin D. That's a real important one. And iodine actually is another one that um, a lot of vegans fall short in meeting. Okay, so you can see specific recommendations for calcium, grains, uh, protein foods. They should have put more nuts here. I didn't see these. They have all legumes. Peanuts are considered a legume. So you see soy, uh, beans, uh, peanuts, and then nuts too. And nut butters are a great source. And you know, lots and lots of different fruits and vegetables are encouraged. So here are some more online resources that I think are really good. There is the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and they have resources not only for RDNs, but also for consumers too. And if you're so inclined, if you're just getting started, if you have a child or a friend or relative who wants to follow a plant-based diet, I think it's good to uh, start off in a very healthy way. I've, I've had so many of my friends tell me that their daughters or sons who are teenagers are following a plant-based diet and their definition of a plant-based diet happens to be French fries and cola for lunch. And we know that that's not a healthy diet at all. And in many instances, it can be more unhealthy than an animal-based diet. And so, um, you know, there's a consumer website, the Vegetarian uh, Nutrition Practice Group consumer website. And we talked about the Vegetarian Resource Group. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is great. Um, and then there are others here as well. Uh, Vegan Health, uh, nutritionfacts.org, and then vegweb.com. Okay, now I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the blue zones. And I said, I said early on, I said, have you heard about the blue zones? And one person I saw I shook their head, yes. And what are the blue zones? Well, this was written about in the scientific literature, as you can see, uh, in 2004. And there were some people, some scientists, who looked around the world and identified places where um, you know, people live a long time, 10 years or more than the average people uh, in the world live. 
And actually living to 100 or even greater is not uncommon in these places. And actually there's a place in the United States, Loma Linda, California, uh, but Costa Rica is one place, Sardinia, Italy, uh, Greece, and then Okinawa. Now think about that. You know, these places have really different diets, don't they? You know, in Okinawa, they, they do eat a lot of seafood. Um, you know, they have a very low fat diet compared to Greece, compared to Italy. But, you know, there are some characteristics in terms of their diet. Um, they, it's a plant-based diet. It's really, really high in plant foods. But in addition to a healthy diet, you can see here a lot of characteristics of these people who are living a long time. What are they? Well, they're physically active. They have a sense of purpose. They manage stress. They don't overeat. And we mentioned they eat a plant-based diet, really high in a variety of different plants. Some of them consume wine. I'm thinking about uh, especially Italy and Greece, uh, but Loma Linda, Loma Linda, where they have the Seventh-day Adventist a religious group, they don't drink wine. Uh, find your community, and that's really a faith-based community. Put family first, and then maintain a social life, an active social life. And so I thought that this was important when we're talking about good nutrition. We're really talking about good health, aren't we? And good health goes beyond just good nutrition. It's just the total package. And so this does relate to Life's Essential Eight, and that's a new program released, released very recently by American Heart Association. And so it used to be Life Simple Seven, but they've added a new lifestyle factor, and that's sleep. Getting adequate sleep is important for good health. But you can see here that um, healthy diet is important. Physical activity is important. Uh, managing glucose levels, managing uh, body weight, uh, having normal blood lipids and lipoproteins, having a normal blood pressure, and avoiding all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. So in summary, then, um, you saw here that a healthy dietary pattern, it's really important to good health. It's so important for preventing major chronic diseases. And what we know about a healthy dietary pattern is that it's nutrient dense, it meets all nutrient recommendations, and, and it also meets you know, nutrient recommendations for health. It's not high in sodium, it's not high in saturated fat. And what we need, know is that there are a lot of health benefits of plant-based diets, but we really have to take care to make sure that it's a healthy plant-based diet that's implemented. It has to meet all nutrient needs, and also it has to focus on whole foods that are minimally processed. And I think that the video that you saw just before my talk tonight is a good illustration of whole foods being minimally processed, being the basis for a healthy plant-based diet. And I was so impressed with that because it was something that could be done so quickly, so healthy, so easy to do. And so then beyond good nutrition, think also about the total package. Just make sure that, that you know, you're doing all these other things as well, because they're really important too overall good health. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have.